our fifth program in our series, Baytown in the Early Years. We are fortunate to have uh, this series videotaped by Alan Swenson and Lee College. And we have someone else taping tonight, Dr. Tom Holsenbach. We're grateful to have uh, the Baytown Sun coverage, and David Moldman is doing a story on that. And we have Lorraine Schiffman from KBUC. I'm very fortunate tonight to have someone in the community who is very knowledgeable about the medical profession. In fact, Rosemary Thompson really put this program together. So I'm going to turn it over to Rosemary so she can introduce our panelists. settlers of the Baytown area had very few doctors practicing among them as they established their homes, but when the oil activity along Cabs Bay and Goose Creek Stream increased, more settlers came and more doctors followed. Some of these stayed just a short time, but others settled here and made valuable contributions to the community. Our approach to the medical history of Baytown tonight will be by first telling you a little bit about some of the very early doctors and then by tracing the roots of our present day hospitals. Dr. Drew Williams and I will be the ones telling you about the early doctors, and then we have Dr. J.C. Holsenbach who talked to you about Humana Hospital, Dr. William H. Bridges who will talk to you about San Jacinto Hospital, Dr. Herbert H. Duke Jr. about Lily Duke Hospital, and Dr. W.T. Jones about Gulf Coast Hospital. I've made some charts over there to help us with some of the dates about the hospitals and some of the early doctors. Well, the very first doctor that we know anything about in this area is Dr. Harvey Henry Whiting. He came from Connecticut in 1833 with his wife and children, and they settled on a Mexican land grant along Goose Creek. You've heard the term a witness to history. Well, this certainly can be said about Dr. Whiting because he was here during the Texas Revolution. He declined to join the Texas Army, but he did deliver a boatload of shoes and boots for their use on credit. Some of his activities immediately preceding the Battle of San Jacinto were misunderstood, and he found it necessary to defend himself in a letter he wrote to the military commandant, a Colonel James Morgan. And this is a fascinating letter because in it, he talks about the runaway scrape, which those of you who go back in history, know that that's the period when the settlers were fleeing eastward in fear of the advancing Mexican troops, and some unscrupulous people were robbing their houses after they vacated them. Well, during this time, Dr. Whiting's letter says that David G. Burnett asked him to go retrieve some books and papers from Burnett's home, Oakland, at Lynchburg. He needed them kept safe. He also wanted him to secure his property as much as he could, but Dr. Whiting said by the time he got there, it had been greatly plundered. He also wrote of a meeting with General Santa Anna and of having to leave his boat by request of Santa Anna so that the Mexicans could use it in a planned crossing of the San Jacinto River. That is, they assumed after they won the battle, they'd be crossing. Apparently, his explanations were sufficient because court records show that in 1838, after five witnesses testified in his behalf, he was issued a certificate for a league and a labor of land by the government of the Republic. That is 4,605 acres of land. You can see why many of Baytown's deeds go back to the Harvey Whiting survey. In fact, we're probably standing on property that once was Harvey Whiting's now because his home was in the vicinity of the old vacated wine garden store in Sears that's close by. He lived here for 20 years, but we really don't know very much about his medical career. But through his daughter, Melissa, we can begin to trace the roots of one of our hospitals. But we're going to put that story aside for just a while because we cannot neglect our most famous early doctor, Dr. Ashville Smith. If Dr. Whiting witnessed history, Dr. Smith made history. And because of our recent unveiling of a statue to him in the Republic of Texas Plaza, uh, a great deal of attention has already been paid to Dr. Smith's place in Texas history as one of the most influential leaders of the 19th century. So tonight, we'll just talk briefly about him and about his medical service in our area. 
Dr. Smith was born in Connecticut, just like Dr. Whiting, and he came to Texas from North Carolina in 1837. He was better educated than most other doctors of his time because he had a medical degree from Yale, plus he'd had additional training in Paris. His contributions to medicine in Texas were so outstanding, and especially his leadership in the founding of the state's medical society, that it resulted in his being called the father of Texas medicine. You see why we can't ignore him in our speech, living here in our area. He had many famous patients, Sam Houston, David G. Burnett, Lamar, J. Pinkney Henderson, and their families. But when he was here at Evergreen, the home he maintained from 1840 to his death in 1886, he would treat the people who worked for him and his neighbors. Probably the most precious patient he had in the Baytown area was a little orphan girl, Anna Allen Wright. She was living at Baylin Orphan Home, which Dr. Smith had helped to establish following the Civil War. He was a staff doctor and he treated her eyes and in time, she became his foster daughter and helped to care for him in his declining years. Well, even the doctor's greatest doctor, Ashley Smith, needed a doctor on his deathbed. And that doctor was pioneer cedar biophysician, Dr. Nicholas Schilling. And here to tell us about Dr. Schilling is Dr. Drew Williams, a surgeon practicing here for 18 years. Dr. Williams. <laughs> down into this area and you can see Trinity Bay, Turtle Bay, Galveston Bay, you see Galveston Island down here, Bolivar, Smith Point. This was one big area. And yet it wasn't so big because it's only natural when people came up to, to visit, they would go straight up this thing. And you can see in this shot, so in Trinity Bay down there, these two blue bodies of water on one side of the Trinity and on the other side of Sandy Center. It was only natural that civilization would begin, begin right here, probably in the upper end of Trinity River. And if you go up to the Wallace Reservoir, Wallace Reservoir you'll find a, a place called Lawrence Island, where they, geologically speaking, uh, got some clamshells back to 10,000 years. When my grandmother talked about going to the city, she always went to the creek. And when she went up to town or went up to visit some friends, she went up to the hill. And so, the history of this area involves not only Harris County, but it involves Chambers County and Liberty County. And all these people go back a long way. This is a map that shows Cedar Bow. You see that building right in the middle there. Just to the left of that is a lot of numbers. And it's too small for anybody to read this, but these are early pioneers. And if you went about three quarters of the way up here, you would see a number 31, I believe it is, and it's marked as Dr. Nicholas Schiller. Well, who is Dr. Nicholas Schiller? That's his picture. Would somebody turn the lights on? I'm going to read you something here. Well, genealogists are funny people. They study and they learn. And I once had a, I think it was Dr. Harlan Smith, wanted to use a story I had about a local doctor, and I told him, I said, well, I've got the story, but I'm not sure about the accuracy of it. And so he says, well, he says, I certainly don't want to use it in, in where I'm talking, so I won't use it. So I'm going to read from a historical marker application form. And this is about Dr. Nicholas Schilling. I think it gives a better rendition than I could as to the history of this man. There's an office building that we'll show in a few minutes. It begins with the office building of Dr. Nicholas T. Schilling. It's located on Chambers County land north of Chambers County Courthouse, at the corner of Washington Avenue and Cummings Street in Anuak, Texas. Dr. Nicholas T. Schilling purchased the property on Cedar Bile in which he constructed his office building when he bought 50 acres of land in the Christian Smith survey in Chambers County from Ellen Kingsley. 
for about $800. That's a good price for, for 50 acres of land, isn't it? That was April the 26th, 1881. Upon Dr. Schilling's death in 1919 and the death of his wife, Lena, in 1922, the office building and 50 acres of land on which it was located became the property of his son, John G. Schilling, and his daughter, Annie Schilling. Uh, Dr. John G. Schilling gave his one-half interest in the 50 acres of land uh, to Miss Annie Schilling in 1940. Uh, after Miss Annie Schilling died in February, on February the 8th, 1966, her heirs sold the land on which the office building was located to the Houston Light and Power Company to construct their single bio generating station. And certain of her heirs gave this office building of Dr. Schilling and its contents to Chambers County. Dr. Schillings came to be a doctor and built his office building in 1890 and his practice, well, it didn't begin with a bang. Let's see, he was the son of John and Annie Schilling born in Bavaria, Germany. After serving in the Civil War as a volunteer in the Maryland Cavalry, I think he was on the Union side, Schilling went to live in Washington, Ohio. He attended Chicago Medical College, now, now Northwestern University Medical School, and received his doctor of medicine there in 1872. When Dr. Schilling came to Cedar Bile, he didn't have enough money to practice medicine. That was in 1874. Now, that little history turned the lights back off again. Let me see what I can do. So this is a picture of it. This is an office which he built. And I think there's some people here that maybe remember this office building. It's out where the Houston Line and Power Company uh, generating plant is now. Well, the unique thing about this was that this building sat intact all these many years. All these many years, up to 1966, after it was closed in 1921. With all of his books, his instruments, and everything intact, this is a very unique thing. And it was given to, to Chambers County, and they made arrangements to take it over to Chambers County and put it up for display. Well, what do you do with a building like that when it's sitting out in the middle of the country? You've got two choices. You can put it on the road, or you can try to get it across to anywhere, however you can. They decided to put it on a barge. And this is the movement of this big house on top of the barge. And here we see it going down Cedar Bottom. Here we see it going through the bridge, which y'all are familiar with. And here we see it out in the middle. Uh, I don't know if that's Trinity Bay now or still in Galveston Bay. But here we are in the upper end of Trinity Bay, and off in the distance you see some of the buildings in Antioch. We see it coming up uh, where I was, when I was coming up, we call this the hill. And this is coming up on top of the hill. The house is being moved up across. This is the courthouse on the right-hand side. This is the building as it was set up. It is the same building that he practiced in for many years. It is an accurate rendition of the way the practice of medicine was back in those years. This is the historical marker that was put on this, which details some of the things we talked about. It tells that the other soul received his payment in forms of vegetables, fruit, livestock, and farm labor. And I suspect there are some gentlemen here that have taken that type of payment for treatment. I'll, I'll bet you'll tell, him, tell you about it. Now, when he went out to make his trips, this is what he hung on his horse. This was his medicine in his little bag that he put on his horse. And this is the top part. And, and when it got here in this upper floor area, it was infested by bees, and they had to clean them all out. This is the room where all his pharmaceuticals were kept. And you see the various walls and the tremendous amount of bottles and medications that are present here. I might show a point or two. This is called Black Hall. This is a type of, uh, of uh, purgative, if you will. I think it's closely related to, what was that terrible drug that used to kill everybody? Either made you well or killed you, one of the two. <laughs> now, those of you that take medication, it's, it's just naturally sweet. Don't realize they had to put this medicine together over on the right-hand side, that blue, blue bottle says peppermint. That's how they flavored their medication as they put it together. Uh, I'm not going to make too many comments about this one except to see the, the second bottle from the left 
shows the common disease today that was treated back in those days too. And I won't go any further than that. Now this is what they treated uh, certain things, like he did dental work. Uh, he also took care of eyes. This is an ophthalmologist set up here with a few things to find out whether you need some reading glasses. Uh, this right in the middle is a wonderful drug which we use every now and then. The yellow stuff, it says Castrol right in the middle. <laughs> and here's more and more of these things. Now this is uh, Kendon Clark on the right hand side who is displaying and what his rendition of what Dr. Nicholas Schilling must have looked like. I'm not sure that that's what Dr. Schilling looked like. I think his hair was a little grayer than that. But in case you're interested, Kendon Clark is a walking encyclopedia of Civil War history. At least he feels like he is, and most people that talk to him know he is. There's a little book. This is the kind of a book that was used to store their information. This is what they made their progress notes on. Here's a little close-up. Uh, this is open to a particular page. This came out of a large collection of these things. Uh, this particular note was dated January the 18th, 1886. I caught it in looking because it's my birthday. And you know, you can look at things like that. Uh, the last word here, it says, uh, he died at 1.17 o'clock a.m., January the 21st, 1886. <coughs> the heart stopped acting and he passed off without a struggle. Uh, J.C. Massey being with him at the time. This is the final progress note of Dr. Nicholas Schilling in caring for the death of Ashville Smith. Thank you very much. Thank you, Drew. Now we can start to weave the tapestry of our story. Dr. Schilling practiced 45 years. He was joined by his son, Dr. John Schilling, in 1910. And when Dr. John Schilling left to serve in World War I, he asked Dr. William Nelson Brooks to take over his practice. Now, Dr. Brooks was the grandson of Dr. Harvey Whiting. See the chart, the first man? He was born on the banks of Goose Creek, near what is now Gulf Coast Hospital, in 1868. And as an infant, he had cholera. And guess who came to take care of him? Dr. Ashville Smith was asked over to take care of him and is credited with saving his young life. It was in Dr. Nicholas Schilling's library that he first began his study of medicine. And now in our story, he has returned home after 20 years of practice in other Texas counties. The next year in 1918, Dr. Lawson A. Hankins came to Goose Creek after practicing 10 years in Oklahoma. Now skip down to 1930, when Dr. Brooks is joined by his son-in-law, Dr. C.H. Langford. Now, we have all the ingredients to start the hospital known as Humana today. And tonight we have Dr. J.C. Holzenbach, who's only been a physician for 54 years, 47 of them, he's even beat Dr. Schilling on that number, here. May I present Dr. Holzenbach? Thank you very much for inviting us, Dr. Sarkone. We sincerely appreciate it. My uh, dissertation will be about the Goose Creek Hospital and successors. In 1932, Dr. Brooks, Dr. L.A. Hankins, and Dr. C.H. Langford founded the Goose Creek Hospital in the rear upstairs apartment of the old Guberman building on West Texas Avenue. The facility had five beds. Uh, as the uh, community grew, so uh, did the need for a doctor and hospital. <coughs> In 1936, in a chance meeting uh, on the road between Goose Creek and Cedar Bow, a conversation was started up uh, between two old friends, Dr. Brooks and Dr. Uh, Mr. Theo Welburn's father. The conversation started with the comfortable shoes that uh, Mr. Welburn was wearing. The senior Mr. Welburn inquired <coughs> about the medical practice, and Dr. Brooks shared uh, about the need and problems in getting funding for a larger hospital. Mr. Wilburn uh, told Dr. Brooks uh, to meet him at the local bank, and a loan was arranged. 
the old Heinz Hotel uh, was uh, an old boarding house built about uh, 1917, and it was located at 119 West Beefy Street. Uh, this was purchased and remodeled into a 12-bed hospital containing operating room and central uh, air conditioning. In January 1939, uh, Dr. Brooks uh, considered retiring. I was invited to come to Goose Creek for a week by Dr. C. H. Langford, a classmate uh, from undergraduate and medical school days. Uh, that week, a vacation changed my life. We worked almost day and night, and by the end of the week, I purchased Dr. Brooks's one-third interest in the Goose Creek Hospital, ordered office furniture, purchased two lots in the Martin edition, and, and uh, purchased the lumber for the new home. A few weeks after I returned to Denver to arrange for my release from the U.S. Army, Dr. Hankins accidentally stuck his finger while opening or lancing a boil. He developed a severe infection of his thumb and subsequently a real severe septicemia development. With the critical illness, my office furniture was canceled. Dr. Hankins recovered and I returned to uh, Goose Creek in March, late March 1939 to find my, my practice only to find an empty office. My furniture had been canceled out for fear Dr. Hankins would not survive. <laughs> Around 1940, Dr. Lankford became ill and drove himself to the hospital in the early morning hours. Uh, he had surgery and the appendix was removed and it was real bad. With evening, he felt much better. He put on his clothes, went downstairs, stepped in his car and drove home. <laughs> I, I really admonished him sternly and said, C.H., you get in that car and go back to the hospital, so he did. <laughs> in 1942, with the war growing uh, growth and the oil industry expansion, a uh, uh, larger hospital facility was needed. Mr. Walling and an architect came uh, and gave their opinion on the expansion. With a loan of $42,000 from the Great Southern Life Insurance Company in Houston, the east wing of the building increased the hospital beds to 35 bed capacity. Between the old and the new building, an hydraulic elevator was installed. This was actually an automobile lift rack that was used. <laughs> After the elevator was installed, a heavy set gentleman remarked, he was one of our prominent citizens here, now doc, you won't have to lift folks to the second floor anymore to make hernias. <laughs> Prior to that time, uh, someone had to uh, be taken upstairs, and if they were unable to walk, we had to lift the removable tabletop off the stretcher and carry the patient up the stairway. In December 1945, one winter night, I received a call from one of my obstetrical patients living in Highlands uh, that she was in labor. She boarded the interurban, but because of a wreck on north of Baytown, the interurban was stopped. I was again called, picking up an OB bag and running by the hospital and picking up the, the OB nurse, Miss Irene Starnes. We followed Art Lindemann's Tri-City Ambulance to North Baytown to the interurban and delivered the uh, healthy baby. Mrs. Uh, Miss Starnes wrapped the infant up in the towel and put it under her coat where she could watch it and detect its breathing. And we were brought back to the hospital. In 1948, after the consolidation of Tri-Cities uh, into Goose Creek, um, and then Goose Creek was incorporated, after that, the hospital was incorporated as Baytown Hospital. We took the name, we outrun them on the bulletin. In January 1951, Dr. Malcolm Jones, uh, who had been at the MBA for many years, purchased one-fourth interest in Baytown Hospital. 
Later that year, Dr. Jones' nephew, Dr. W.T. Jones, bought Dr. Langford's one-fourth interest. Dr. Langford, who had uh, developed some health problems, retired and moved to Bendel. In 1959, Dr. W.T. Jones sold his interest to Dr. Lewis B. Hughes and went to help found the Gulf Coast Hospital with a group of his associates. In 1961, Dr. Hankins said, well, Dr. Joe, I'm going to turn this over to you to manage now. <laughs> Dr. Hankins has been president, I think, most all the time from the time it was organized. <clears throat> Dr. Hankins sold his one-fourth answer to Dr. Philip T. Eichelberger and retired. He was accidentally killed in a tragic automobile accident in Meridian, Mississippi, one year later. Dr. Hankins said of his life, I may have never been a, the greatest doctor in the world, but if I have fulfilled my duties to my family, my God, I, I will feel that I have been successful. In 1967, Dr. Malcolm Jones retired and sold his interest in the Baytown Hospital to Dr. Thomas N. Holsenbach, who later returned to Baytown after completing his residency in general surgery. The hospital owners, Dr. Lewis B. Hughes, Dr. Philip T. Eichenberger, Dr. Thomas N. Holsenbach, and myself dreamed of building a new hospital, a 100-bit uh, facility on 14 acres of land that had been acquired on North Alexander Drive and James Bush School Drive. However, the financing was out, was not available. To realize this dream, we sold the Baytown Hospital to Extendicare Incorporated, the predecessor of Humana Corporation. And that was in 1970. Two years later, in 1972, the new facility opened as the Baytown Medical Center Hospital. In 1983, as a part of the nationwide upgrading within Humana, the hospital's name was changed to Humana Hospital Baytown. In an attempt to preserve part of the original name, the professional building was named the Baytown Medical Hospital. In having had the opportunity to see and be a part of this hospital, I have seen the culmination of many of my hopes and dreams. Thank you. We thank you so much for sharing some of those with us. Now let's go back in time to 1917. The U.S. has entered World War I that year and the demand for petroleum products soars. The activity around the Goose Creek oil field brought more people and more doctors. We've already mentioned Dr. Brooks and Dr. Hankins. Another was Dr. Adam J. Zielinski. Another Dr. Frank L. Robbins, who became the city health officer. Another was a Dr. Nicholas Dudley, whose description of the oil field town that he came to was a hall.